All right, guys, Shay Baker here with Wishing I Was Fishing. So here we are. We're on episode eight. We got two hammers from the FIW Pro Circuit. They're going to be on here with us. Uh, Matt Becker and Gray Buck. We're going to have a good time talking to those guys. Becker is actually fishing a tournament right now. Uh, one of the weird things that's starting back up. We're actually going to start fishing tournaments again. It's pretty exciting. So we're going to talk to him about that some. And, yeah, we're just going to hang out and uh, talk fishing with you guys. So anybody got a question for Becker or Buck? Just go over there in the comments and throw a little comment in there. Let us know you got a question, and we'll do a little, uh, you know, a little bit of here and a little while, and we'll answer it. And that's pretty much how this is going to go. So, without further ado, let's bring Gray Buck in first. See if we can't get him up here on the screen. Hey, Buck, how's it going, bud? Can you hear me? I cannot. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Still nothing. There's like a, whoa, let's see here. Um, Hold on, Matt, can you hear me? All right, we're going to kick Becker, I mean, we're going to kick Buck out and bring Becker in for a second. Can you hear me now? I can hear you. Can you hear me? All right, we're, right, we're going to see if we can't get him back in here. Just say, we have all sorts of technical difficulties. So, without further ado, let's see if Becker can hear me. Can you hear me, Becker? I can. Everything looks good here. Yeah, it's pretty interesting. This was working perfectly fine five minutes ago. And uh, we all got ready, and then we jumped in, and there you go. So, what's up? So, you're fishing a derby right now, man. What's up with that? I am. I'm on uh, Pickwick. Actually, I uh, first tournament back. You know, I couldn't stand sitting around any longer, so I went and signed up for the uh, Toyota Series on Pickwick. And uh, we're here. Today was day one. You know, I caught 13 pounds, so I'm sitting in uh, 50th place guess it was a solid day um, i'm a little yeah. disappointed in it but we're going to try and upgrade on it tomorrow well uh so what's the i mean 13 pounds pickwick you know for a while they were just unreal and it seems like all those ledge fishing lakes now they're so everybody's got a graph everybody knows what they're doing now so much pressure offshore what's uh i think i looked at it so first was like 24 pounds maybe yeah of course buddy gross is why but there, I, don't, I don't see that there's not like 20, 20 pound bags like they used no. to. Just no, no, no. Tougher. So, what are you doing out there this week to catch them if you don't mind talking about it before the tournament's over with? Well, shoot. I mean, I signed up to, to learn how to ledge fish. You know, I don't have a whole lot of experience doing that. So, I wanted to come down here and learn how to do that. So, that's pretty much all I've done. And I've just ran through a whole variety of baits you know i probably got 15 rods on the deck right now just rotating through to to whatever they'll bite you know they're they're real pressured right now so they're hard to get the bite and that's something that i'm still learning is i can find the fish just fine but i'm not confident in how to get them to bite so i've been messing around with all different baits and stuff this week trying to figure out how to get them to bite um you talk about jumping in that tournament just kind of get going again you were on a pretty good little head of steam there sitting in second in points uh, for the pro circuit. How frustrating is it to get in that groove and then be shut out? Yeah, I mean, that definitely sucks. You know, it, it, it was nice. We were rolling pretty good there, so I wanted to keep going and have a couple-month break. Uh, definitely puts a damper in things, but, again, it was just nice to get out again and fish a derby again today and uh, put some fish in the, the live well and, did decent, I guess, you know, top, oh, yeah. third, top third of the field, I guess. So hopefully we can build on that tomorrow and, you know, stay in that check range. Yeah, that place too, man, any cast can be, especially out there, any cast can be an eight or 10 pounder. So you go from 13 pounds to 10 pounds right away. So. I know, and I weighed in a couple two pounders today, so I definitely had room to upgrade. What uh, What's different? about the tournament scene right now can you tell i mean is everybody just having to wear a mask or buffs or trying to do social distancing is there any kind of crowd what what can we expect from tournament fishing moving forward at least in the foreseeable future what's it looking like out there yeah i mean they're doing a couple little things different as far as uh weigh-in procedure and uh you know they're kind of spacing out the flights a little more so we're not kind of grouped up as much together and a little bit less of a bag line so you know there's not many people crowded at once but the way in and the takeoff everything went extremely smooth you know there was no hiccups and honestly it, it ran better than a 
a normal event or an event in the past, you know, it just went so smooth and there was no, no waiting around or hanging out with a bunch of people. So it was just a pretty streamlined process. So I was actually pretty impressed with it. You know, it, uh, no issues at all. Let's see if we can bring great buck back in and uh, see if we can get the audio here. Hopefully now, can you hear us? Buck? Yeah. Can you hear me guys now? Yeah. Yeah. We got you. Uh, Perfect. So, I don't know what happened there. Becker uh, sitting in second in points. I believe you're sitting in sixth. Right, Buck? Uh oh, kicked him out. He's booted. Yeah, he booted. He go. So yeah, Buck sitting in second in points. I mean, six in points. Becker in second. So we got two guys doing really well this season, and um, really, y'all both had a good couple of years or three or four years getting going in the, um, the pro circuit there. What, what's changed, if anything, from since the merger with MLF? Have you noticed anything really changed on the day-to-day -day from the angler standpoint? No, nah, this year has been business as usual. You know, we've had a couple new faces and a couple, you know, handful of guys leave us, but it's pretty much been business as usual. And uh, at the end of the day, you know, it's you versus the fish. It don't matter who you're launching the boat against. So you still got to go out there and catch them the best you can. So it don't matter who you're fishing against. That's right. What uh? So mention that too. So we we have these super tournaments coming up where yeah, some of the MLF or I guess a lot of the MLF uh, pro tour guys are going to come in and fish. What obviously that doesn't affect angler of the year. I mean your points are going to just be for for the guys that were fishing the pro circuit and not include the pro tour. Uh, but that does come into effect. Obviously when you got anglers of that caliber out there mixing it up y'all and you both find the same fish. I mean, it can definitely change a lot of stuff. So it's going to be interesting to see how that, what are your thoughts? What are you looking at on that? Um, have you even given it much thought? Yeah. You know, you hit the nail on the head there where it's not going to necessarily affect the point standings, but it's certainly going to affect the outcome of the event. You know, whereas if I found a spot to myself and a Bass Pro Tour angler found the same spot, you know, we're, I'm going to be sharing that spot with them, whereas if they weren't in it, I would have had it to myself. So it could affect the standings that way. But at the end of the day, you know, it's still me against the fish. It's not sure. – uh, it doesn't matter who I'm fishing against or launching. So that really doesn't bother me or anything. Um, I like what they've done to the payout, and they've uh, expanded the media coverage. So that, that's a win-win to me. Um, you just got to go out and perform, and, and you're going to be rewarded for it. So it's all about catching bass. That's right. We've got Buck up here. We're going to try one more time. See if we can get here. Buck, can you hear us? Can you see us? Everything going to get right? Yeah, I think we're good now. I don't know there what the phone was doing there. Tweaking out a little bit. <laughs> Nothing wrong with it. Everything's good. We've been talking, uh, talking fish and talking about the merger with MLF and FLW and uh, kind of what to expect from these super tournaments. Oh, yeah. Um, what, what, are you, what have you seen so far? What are you kind of looking at with that deal? Is it going to change your game plan, your strategy? Um, it's just going to be a bigger field, so there's going to be more fish and pressure on different areas, and it's going to make a lot of the places fish smaller, I would assume. Um, it'll make you have to think about it, especially, like, say, the Mississippi, where you can lock through and go up to pool seven or down to pool nine. It's going to make you have to consider that more, because last time we were there, and uh, I believe it was 2017, I stayed in pool eight, and there was a lot of boats, but there was still only 150 of us at the time. So I don't know. It's just, you're going to have to kind of play with it a little bit and make more decisions about where you actually want to go. What is the field size of that now? So official field size, how many of the guys are going to fish? Uh, I think it's 204 or two, 204, two, 206. Five. I can't remember. Yeah, that's pretty good. And y'all, y'all still have, I guess, two or three days of official practice. Yeah. The, everything stayed the same format wise. So we got three days of practice and, yeah, those fish are going to get hammered on. <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But, I mean, like I said, you know, the cream always rises to the top. That's what Pop says. So, you just got to keep on, keep it on, keep churning, and you'll get there. Um, yeah, but you're in six, right, in the pro circuit points? Yep. That's awesome, man. Y'all both have a great year. Uh, we talked to Baker a little bit about that, how it's – I mean, it's small potatoes in the grand scheme of things, what all's going on. But it's very frustrating, I'm sure, to be on the roll and – be, you know, getting in a good groove and then have to shut the whole thing down for a couple of months and sit on your hands. Yeah, absolutely. Between just having that good momentum going for us, and then I was really looking forward to 
fishing Hartwell and Cherokee coming up there. It was uh, setting up some, some good pre-spawn spawn tournaments, and I felt like both of us were going to go out there and really catch up with those next two. Dardanelle might have been a little different, but we would have figured it out. We would have had two more, hopefully, good tournaments under our belt, and then St. Clair, you know we're both going to go out there and hammer a bunch of big smallmouth. Y'all both, uh, both did good at Cherokee last year. What is there something that translates – for y'all, from where you fish up north to Cherokee, does it fit your style both pretty well, being smallmouth anglers up north? or Well, I have a lake close to my house that, that's very similar to Cherokee. It's just a lot smaller. So I was kind of familiar with that, that type of fishery. But um, at the same time, Cherokee was a lot different than – than that lake at home, just in, as far as where the fish were spawning. So it took a little bit of figuring out, but I felt very comfortable there for sure. Well, I do tips and uh, tips and tricks. And one of the baits we've been talking about lately, the Bagley, also, B, uh, what do you like to do with it? Is there anything you do with it outside, like cold water situations? or? That's what I was just playing with here. You know, I was just thinking about changing out the treble hooks a little bit. You know, there's kind of a little bit of a shad spawn still going on here at Pickwick. So this is a good alternative when you get around that shad spawn. It just got that tight wiggle, and it, it kind of imitates the, uh, the shad when they're spawning. Um, you know, I was just, just playing with it here, thinking my rig went up. I got an early boat draw tomorrow, so I, I'm going to try and get on a shad spawn spot or two and see if I can't catch a couple on that. But most of the time, this is a uh, cold water bait. You know, it's a flat side, so it's got that real tight wiggle to it. So when that water gets, you know, below 50 degrees, that's when you want to be throwing this flat side. Seems like I remember, I think it was, well, I guess we talked about, I was about to bring up an old tournament at Big Week that uh, Hagney did good doing something similar to that. But I don't guess you talked about it. That's not really getting information. This is public forum, but we won't even get into that. But it is interesting to think about fishing that in like a shad spawn scenario. Uh, that's interesting. You know, yeah, anything you can do to look like them, them shad that are spawning, you know, that's certainly going to uh, help you get a few more bites. Well, uh, so what's next after this one? When does when does that first super tournament kick off? I believe we have a couple weeks. It's it's the middle of June, I think, is when uh, we start awesome. Kamaga. And that's um, the. Do they have that heavy hitters tournament? MLF Pro heavy hitters tournament. Yeah, I think that's next I'm week. Sure my screen yeah, that's right. June. I think it starts June seventh. So that's going to be between that and next week. Yeah. yeah. We start. Yeah. I'm planning on after this event. I'm I think I'm gonna head over to Chickamauga for a few days and uh, just look around a little bit, see if I can't check out a new area of the lake or something like that. You know, I kind of struggled there last year, so I'm uh, looking to put that behind me and get that monkey off my back and, and find something a little different. Heard that. Well, uh, so what, what's your what's your game plan? What you going to do different out there tomorrow? Uh, we're still trying to get Buck back on the line. What are you going to do? You just kind of, like I said, just keep grinding on that ledge deal and try to hope you get one of those bigger bites? Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I kind of ran through my schools today and I kind of figured out which ones are still there and which ones moved a little bit. And uh, I don't know, I figured out where I think I need to be tomorrow. So I'm going to probably hunker down in a couple couple schools tomorrow and just try and milk them for as much as I can. And, uh, you know, if I get to that 13, 14 pound range again and lock up a check, then I might go uh, – you know, hunt for a big one or something, but but I really don't know what to do to catch a big one here. So I don't know. I'm gonna have to think about it, sleep on it, and uh, see what see what comes tomorrow. You know, but definitely plan on starting on where I caught the most fish today. You know, I probably caught 25, 30 fish out of one school, so I'm probably gonna start there and and beat on them pretty good in the morning. Yeah, I, that'll work. Yeah, that's uh, that sounds like a pretty hot hole. Are you able to? Like that place uh, and all those ledge lakes is so hard. So you got to hurry the boat draw. You should be able to get there then. It's just hard to find. Like you almost got to take a number most of the time in those places. But you got to hurry the number, so maybe you can get on that spot anyway, huh? Yeah, that's what I'm hoping. You know, I got like boat 30 or something tomorrow. So I, I should be able to 
race that Phoenix down the lake and pass a few guys and, and get there and get on it. So hopefully I can get set up on there and uh, get a few in the boat. All right, we're going to try. We're still trying to get Buck in here. And, um, I think like, a new phone. Yeah, we tried it with a computer earlier too, and we're having trouble with the computer. We still can't get Buck back in here. I'm, uh, I'm on my computer now. It's working good. What's up, Gray? How you doing, buddy? Oh, we're back. You scrambling over there? Yeah, I've been messing with all sorts of things, but now I'm on my uh, wife Jess's phone trying that. We'll see if this hey, works better. You got to love technology and live. Uh, yeah, very good with it either. Yeah. We did this. I mean, we sat around for about 20 minutes before the show started and talked and hung out. And yeah. Everything. Yeah, it was working fine. And then all of a sudden. The pressure gets to it and everything collapses. You can't take it. So uh, one of the things we like to do on the show is a Mercury moment. And uh, we got – Buck's got one for us. You know, you won at Oneida, right, a couple – or last year, won one of the Opens, got into the Bassmaster Classic. Talk about, you know, when you need that Mercury and it, and it doesn't fail on you. Talk about that story about coming in from uh, – it's a pretty big, pretty big win in waves, huh? Yeah. It was blowing real hard on day three of that tournament there. And I was running down the lake, and I had a pretty good bag, but – I knew I needed some more weight there. I needed to call up at least one or two more times. So I made a long run and it was rolling good three, four footers out of the uh, east there, which is not a fun way for that lake, how it sets up east and west. But having that mercury, I was able to run through it, get my triton all the way down there and make the run back after catching the, the two more fish I needed to get the win there. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, what Winning is so hard. And uh, you and Becker have both done that. I've had a couple of tournaments where I was in contention here and there, but like winning those bigger tournaments is so hard. What's that like? Knowing you just punched your ticket to the class, and knowing that you, you got it done and that early in your career too. I mean, you're a fairly young guy, and uh, it gets you off to once you have, I think, the confidence of knowing you can win one. It's got to make you a better angler and a bigger threat moving forward. And my, I mean, I've watched a lot of guys fish and. They always, once they kind of get that first one, it seemed to get that hunger and that and that uh, that bite where they, they can get it done again, you know? Yeah, absolutely. I fished the entire Open Series last year for that tournament on Oneida. I knew that place very well, and I wanted to have a shot at making the Classic, and I really, truly believed I could go out to that lake and win that tournament. So anything less than first there, I would have been kind of mad about, and – I've had a lot of success there fishing BFLs. I've won two of them in the last couple of years. I got a couple of seconds and thirds there. It, it's just something with that lake that gels with me, and I'm able to go out there and catch those uh, smallmouth. And it's just been a really special place. Yeah, you put a lot of time in out there too. We wrote an article uh, a little while back for Angler, talking about some of that and uh, about that win. Talk about the importance of good graphs and uh, you know that seat time trying to learn a lake like that. Absolutely. I've spent so much time idling and looking at my HDS 12s out there. I've had, I guess on the last three, four boats I've had, so I've always had Lawrence to use the side imaging. I go out there and I mark a lot of rock. Um, the glaciers that were there when it, the lake formed, it pushed these rock strips into certain areas. And if I mark each end of it, I can set up and make the right cast and I can keep my bait on those rock strips the entire time. And what that does is it keeps your bait where the crayfish are, where those gobies are, where the small guys will be feeding. So you're not wasting any of your cast, throwing it in the sand and getting on the areas that the smallmouth really aren't keying on. It's just, you have to have those Lawrence units. Um, you got to put a lot of time in and it pays off if you put the work in with it. Well, settings is another thing. You know, a lot of people want to know what's, what's your settings? Like what do you, how do you set up your graph? And I mean, you have to change stuff as you go, right? Yeah. So I usually start off on auto and then I will adjust from there, depending on the lake you're at, the depth, um, maybe a little bit with water clarity. It changes what the picture is going to be showing. So I like to adjust the contrast. I'll either bump it up a little bit or sometimes I even bump it down to below the auto setting. And it just, it'll make your rocks and grass lines show up that much better. I got you. Well, uh, that's good stuff. So let's see if we can get Becker back in here. 
let's see. Everything's working so smoothly right now. Isn't that nice? What's going on, Baker? How's it going, bud? I'm back. I'm back. I heard that. So which of y'all is going to win Angler of the Year? Shoot. Uh, <laughs> Ron Nelson? Yeah, right. He's actually running pretty good. Man. He's doing pretty good. But, you know, hey, everybody have a bad derby. That's right. I mean, I'm just taking it one day at a time. You know, I got to catch my 15 pounds a day no matter where we go, and, and we'll be doing all right. So there's so we'll, much. We'll get back back with you in a couple more derbies, and then we'll see where we're at. All right, there's so much going on. It's hard to keep up with everything as far as, like, uh, I saw today uh, Bagley uh, was acquired by, I think, North American. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty exciting news. Yeah, that's pretty cool. And then uh, Mercury, uh, I mean, no more Everidge apparently, or e yeah. So I saw where they are still going to do their, their boats uh, and some of their watercraft, and they've signed a deal, I guess, with Mercury to power those since they're not doing their own uh, motors anymore. So, like I said, there's a lot going on in the industry. It's hard to keep up with everything. So I was curious, how many, is it five of those super tournaments that are left for y'all for end of the year to, to decide that, or how many was it? Three. 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 So there's three more tournaments left for y'all for the whole tour and for for MLF Pro Tour too. So wow, that's that's gonna be a pretty quick sprint to the finish line there for you guys. Yeah, I'm I'm ready for it. You know, I'm I'm looking forward to it. It's gonna be a busy summer. You know, I think I'm gonna get into the Northern Toyota series as well. So it's gonna be pretty busy, you know, pretty much back to back to back to back. But yeah. I'm ready for it. You know, we've had a couple months off, so I, I'm ready to get into the swing of things. I would love to be a tournament director right now. You know how hard yeah. it is to schedule tournaments without being on top of each other. And now, like every I think at one time I saw an update from FLW. It was like um, eighty-three BFLs now to be rescheduled or something from, from this <laughs> shutdown. Like, oh my gosh! There's no way you would be on top of everybody. No, you know, it's a madhouse. But I'm glad that the season is gonna is gonna happen. Still, so for a little while there, it looked like. You know, they might close things down on both sides for the whole summer and fall and just skip the season. Nobody really knew. I don't know. They were fighting not to do that, I'm sure, on both sides. You know, with NASA and MLF and with uh, FLW, all three of the, the organizations trying to keep everything going. But it looks like we're going to get to see some, some fishing. So, um, like I said, there's some things that are different already that you can see at Pickwick this week. But at least we're going to get to see some more fishing and hopefully everybody can stay safe we can kind of wind our way through this thing and, and kind of got to figure out how to live with it, it looks like at this point for sure you know and it was just starting there at lake martin for our last event and honestly that was one of the smoothest events we've ever had you know so everything went so smooth so i, I wouldn't be opposed to just fishing every event that way yeah i agree yeah. that was the best <laughs> way and i've ever been a part of yeah, everything just went so smooth, everything, that whole week. So they did a great job, you know, uh, given the circumstances and putting everything together so fast. But I think everything went so smooth that we should make that the uh, the new standard. Yeah, I think part of it's probably not having uh, everybody get up there and thank their uh, sponsors and, you know, have it. You got to do some of that. You know, you'll get a guy out there that's in like 173rd and he'll get up there and think, do it more. Do it more where he can make his own shaky head worms because that's the deal. And he puts yeah. this amount of salt in them and you kind of get like, all right, you know, is all that necessary every day? I mean, on the last day of the year, yeah, let everybody do their little spiel. But anyway, it is nice to kind of just roll through it and get the meat out of a tournament. That's kind of what we're doing now. We're just going out there and duking it out and seeing what happens and don't have a lot of fluff around, you know, around the edges of it. Yep, that's right. So what about – great. You were in the uh, the Classic, and that didn't seem like it was going to happen there for – I mean, it obviously that was going to be one. If they had to reschedule that, it was going to be a madhouse. I mean, oh, yeah. that's like – yeah. So, But it was kind of right on the cusp, and it was one of the last tournaments to happen. So, Yeah, we were but, a week early enough is basically what it came down to. If it would have been the yeah. next week, I'm not so sure we would have been fishing. I think the next week like, – Four or five days later, the NBA shut down. That was kind of the first thing that tipped everything off. Yep. And, uh, I mean, that would have been – what was the vibe there? Was anybody even talking about it then? It's so weird how it went from zero to 100 real quick. 
Yeah, uh, but, there were some people talking about it, and I was walking with John Cox the one night back to the hotel room from the boatyard. We were both joking that we had to make sure we made the day three cut so we didn't get uh, stuck working the show with everybody in there and have to be shaking hands and taking pictures. It seemed like the safest bet was to be on the water still. Yeah, yeah that's uh, it's interesting. So enough talking about that. We got Derek Corner with an Angler over here. We're going to pop him in. We're going to let him talk with us a little while here. Let's see. He's, y'all are both familiar with Angler and uh, with Derek. Hey, Derek, how's it going, bud? Morning, guys. Hello. Hello. Hey, everybody. So I, uh, I guess I'm disappointed to announce that I'm not going to fish the Northern uh, Toyota Series now. That Becker's going to fish them. So that's- <laughs> come on, <laughs> good call. Come on. I don't need the to donate my money. The more, the merrier. <laughs> no, I'm good. Um, so I know you guys. You know, obviously, both of you uh, from Pennsylvania. I myself come from Pennsylvania. Um, I've traveled not nearly as much as you guys, but how do you feel like having that background in Pennsylvania gives you either a good advantage or a bad advantage going to Southern bodies of water and, you know, those Midwest bodies of water? Well, honestly, Gray and I are from opposite ends of Pennsylvania, so they're a little bit different, but like my perspective around Pittsburgh, um, you know, the fishing sucks. Just put it like it does. So, like, when I go to a place that sucks and it's hard to get a bite, I feel right at home. So, I kind of welcome that, I guess. And, you know, I, I don't mind going out and grinding to get five bites a day or whatever it may take. But, you know, as far as seeing different types of lakes, not really. You know, it's all been a learning curve heading south and everything. So, I don't know if. Same out east in Pennsylvania, but western Pennsylvania, it's pretty bad. Yep. Yeah. Basically, out in eastern Pennsylvania, the actual we're state of Pennsylvania, it's not great, but I can drive down to the Chesapeake. It could be there in an hour and a half, and there's some good fish in there. It takes some time to figure out how to catch those ones. It's like a hero or zero place, it seems like. Well, someday you'll go out there and catch 25 pounds, and other days you go out there and catch one fish. It's it takes a lot to figure out, but once you kind of dial it in, which I've been playing with it down there the last probably two, three weeks, and I've had two of my best days down there, and there's some giants, and it just sets up nice. But like I said, in the state of Pennsylvania, it's kind of iffy. There's no big lakes I can run my motor on within probably an hour of my house. So it's, and we don't have the big reservoirs that down south have, I guess. So the translation is not really there. Like we were uh, kind of relating that back to, I never fished south of Pence or probably Virginia before my first year on tour. So that was also quite the learning curve trying to go to say, I think Cumberland was the one that kind of overwhelmed me the first time I went there. I went and spent a day and a half in a Creek and never covered it all. And it was just, that was just one arm of the lake. It was unbelievable. Yeah. I remember you telling me about that. Um, I like how you're going to gloss over that uh, New York's not too far away either. Nah, it's like three and a half. <laughs> well, yeah. New York's the best <laughs> fishing in the country. I agree. I love it up there. I keep telling uh, Jay that, and he won't come on up. The first time I went to New York, I was covering, uh, I think it was like an FW. Yeah, it was not a coast even then. It was the Everstarts. I, or, I don't know. I was covering, maybe it was FW Tour. I was covering something on Champlain. And the first time I ever went to New York, uh, I got off the plane and got a rental car or whatever, and I start driving. I'm like, where's the city? I don't know. How, and I was very old for this. I was like, and, you know, in my 20s, 25. But I, I'm from South Alabama, naturally. So when I got off in New York, I expected to see New York City. And I go driving, and there's evergreen forests and, like, no cell service for miles and miles and miles. And I get out in the middle of this forest, and there's a little, looks like a payphone or some kind of little deal with a blue light on it on the side of the road. I'm like, what is that? And I remember seeing one every few miles, and I don't know what it was. So I asked somebody, and they were like, yeah, if you break down, you know, you don't have cell service out here, so you have to, you know, walk to the, one of those and call call somebody for help. And I'm like, that is not, this is not what I expected out of New York. It's beautiful. I love it. Champlain, I didn't get the fish there, but that looks like one of those places where there's just so much, well, Ticonderoga is right in my alley, but there's, so much too with the smallmouth stuff up north and it's a, a beautiful fishery. So what 
What about, you know, a lot of guys move south uh, or move, I guess, east from California now to be, uh, you know, as close to the mix. And, and there's a lot of diversity here, too, as far as fishing goes versus some other places in the country. Have either one of y'all considered that uh, in your careers to move down here to try to get closer to things and also be able to fish all year kind of and, and not have the freeze over stuff and all that? For sure. For sure, you know, but on one hand, like, I want to get down south and figure out the Tennessee River and all the southern fisheries, but the other hand, it's like smallmouth. Yeah. It's smallmouth wins, so, like, it's hard to move away from those smallmouth, but I think, like, as a business decision, yes, moving south would definitely make the most sense, and, like, you know, then you're not traveling as far to most of the events, and you know, you're here, you can fish all the time and all that, but those small mites get me. Yeah, when the fishing is good there, it's fantastic. Like, when it's on, it's on, but I don't see how, like, I call Derek sometimes, I'm like, you know, what, what y'all doing up there? They're like, oh, we're thinking about going on the ice, and I'm like, what, what is that? Like, that's, <laughs> go come ice fish. No, I'm not, you know, like, we got, every now and then our lake will freeze over, and about a quarter ounce of water usually crack it. So you don't have to worry about it too much. But no, I mean, it, I would love to come up there when it's right on, on the smallmouth stuff. And I've done it a couple of times when I was working the Elite Series. I'd have a day or two between tournaments to go out there, and I had no clue what I'm doing. And I don't get, I don't like getting waypoints and stuff for time. I don't like get a lot of information. Whenever I go fish a tournament, I just go fish. But I remember Zaldane, I asked him uh, if he could send me like a couple of waypoints. I don't even remember which lake it was, maybe Ontario or something. I don't know. One of those big bodies of water I got up there, but he had done good there. So he sent me a couple of waypoints, and I went out there with a tube and caught like a six-pound smallmouth and a couple other three-pounders. And I was like, this is – those fish are so silly. There's so much water out there for those fish to swim around and never see a bait. Yep. How how do you break down those lakes? I don't see how you even get out there. I guess, like you said, Bucks, just a lot of graphing. I mean – Yeah. You start staring at your Lawrence and – do that for days on end and you eventually find a, either a school of them or you find the rock that they're going to be on at some point and a lot of that's all current oriented like especially if you're self talking about like lake ontario the yeah. wind can be blowing one direction and then the next day it'll change and those fish are gone not that matter if i have ever experienced that out there yeah, right. <laughs> they, they vanish as, as much as the weather changes you know so but the, the good thing about natural lakes it seems like is once you figure it out, like they use the same areas every year. So like, and, you know, it may take you a little while to figure it out, but once you figure it out, like it's, it's repetitive. So you can go back to the same spots every year and whack on them. So. Speaking of that, is that what you were doing on Erie with those uh hundred fish days, like back to back to back to back to back to back? Yeah, that was a lot of fun, you know? This, this spring was kind of colder than usual, so, like, what I think was happening is they kind of migrate into this one bay to spawn. And, uh, you know, usually as a wave comes in, they'll stage for, you know, a couple days or a week, and then they'll go up and spawn. But it kept getting cold front after cold front, so more fish just kept coming in, but they weren't leaving their spots to go spawn. So they were just getting really piled up on those spots. It was real specific. You know, a lot of people weren't catching them as good because they were just really staging on certain little spots. So you could go and fish a couple, you know, little staging spots and just catch them cast after cast. Man, it, it was incredible this year. And I've never seen it that good. You know, I haven't really fished it that much because usually we're fishing tournaments this time of year. And uh, this break was, was pretty welcome for me. You know, I got up there and got to really fish it now that I – kind of know what i'm doing i still don't think i'm that good of a fisherman but like i feel like i'm better than years ago so like i got to like look at it from a different way and, and kind of break it down a little different and man that was a lot of fun they were they were biting pretty good and there was a lot of big ones piled up in there this year yeah second in aoy right now he ain't that good i'm not i'm telling yeah. you i'm just lucky lucky i have to i have to room with that all year <laughs> yeah, yeah. They would say they'd rather be lucky than good any day. So sometimes lucky it works out for you, but I highly doubt it's all luck. We got yeah. a, we got a couple of questions in here. Uh, you guys send any questions 
and uh, we'll get them in front of the guys and let them see. So Colin McCain here, for both or either, and whichever one of you want to take it, uh, confidence to go to baits if the day isn't going so great. So Buck, what, what do you pick up when you can't get a bite and you need one? My two baits are, if I'm trying to cover waters, I pick up that Z-Man jackhammer and I'll throw that thing until my arm falls off. Or if it's really tough and I kind of have an area I think they might be in, I like putting that uh, Z, uh, the Z-Man TRD. I throw it on that Hayabusa with a 10th ounce head. It's just a little Ned rig set up. I feel like between the two of them, I can either finesse one up or I can just cover enough water and cause a reaction strike with that jackhammer. My other question about that so you're throwing out on a 10 pounds head what kind of rod are you running for that it's a favorite rod i throw it on the 721 jackhammer it's a medium heavy but it's i would say it's more medium action when you're comparing it to other rod companies so it's it lets you get a long cast out of it but you also have enough backbone to really still get a good hook in them even on the end of those long casts okay what about becker what's your go-to bait when it's hard to get a bite Shoot, that is uh that's a tough one. I'd have to probably say a Sanko. You know, if I need a fish, I'm going to a Sanko, whether it's from around grass and whatnot, it'd be a Texas rig or weightless, but docks or anything, go with a wacky rig, but I don't know. I I really don't have a single confidence bait like that. You know, I usually throwing a variety of different baits and just grinding on them, trying to get five a day. You know, I'm usually never on much, so it's usually just a fiasco to try and get a few in the boat. Yeah, I used to fish with a guy who was very uh, humble, misplaced humble, this, like you know, Jordan Lee. He would do that too. He would pick up what they were biting is the problem. That's that's what he would throw to get a bite. It would be the exact yeah. right, right time. So that's basically what you're – do it. You're just picking up whatever. Like, yeah, that looks good. And he thought out there get a bite. Yeah, that's fishing instinct. I mean, that's awesome. That's uh, very hard to do when you do get to that point where you just you just feel it. That's good. So Duke, uh, Duke here's got a. I think this one's gonna be few. <laughs> yeah. yeah, Duke. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, there we go. Look at it. It's flowing. There it is. Look at the flow. Oh, yeah. Look, that look hair a longer on my hockey yeah. hair back. <laughs> wow! Does it off. <laughs> Why do you run down the lake with your hat off? What are you gonna look like? I got a nice skeet reese flow going then. Yeah, you gotta bleach it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we got Adam wants to know what your favorite meal is when you stay in Kentucky. We were just talking about. Oh, so, so Adam, Adam is is my my second home. I have a key to the house. You know, I, I can just show up anytime I want. That's my pit stop anytime I'm going anywhere in the country. And usually, me and his wife go and get Chipotle. That's my favorite meal in Kentucky. You know what? You're right. That is the best Chipotle in the country. I tell everybody about that place. I don't know what it is about that specific location, but it's the best burrito every single time. Always. <laughs> Always. All right, guys, keep your questions coming. We're going to hang out with you guys here and chat it up a little while. I got one. What do you guys like with your Chipotle burrito? Like, what do you what do you get? Oh. Oh. I'm going to be know, honest. I'm going to be honest. Me and Kurt Mitchell have been staying here. We've been here for, what, six days now? And I think we've had Mexican five nights. There you go. Um, I am all about my Mexican food. When I go to Chipotle, I, I mix it up. I get everything. You know, I'll get chicken burrito. I'll get a steak bowl. I'll get tacos. I get – you name it. I get it all. I'll mix it up. So I can't I can't pick one. Okay. Gray? I typically go with the burrito. I'll mix it up between chicken and steak, but I, I have a hard time not getting the burrito. I just like it. It's so much food and – it's just delicious. I get usually black beans on it, some guacamole, a little bit of lettuce, cheese. It, it's that's my go-to. If no one's yeah. dinner yet, well, you're welcome. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty hard here in the conversation, but apparently we got a lot of hungry folks on tonight. So, what's your favorite boat snacks? Everything. <laughs> I eat a lot, especially this week. I've been idling, so I've been taking a multiple sandwiches and everything, but. Something new that I, I discovered this week is those uh, their mango habit or habanero barbecue almonds. 
I think it's pronounced Jabonero. What, whatever. No, I, it's, it's not. I'm a, Yankee. I'm a Yankee. I just spell yeah. it out. Just yeah. like tournament and tournament. Yeah. Spell it out. There's another. I had, I had a buddy one time. It drove me nuts. He said, tournament, tournament, tournament. I said, that, why do you say it like that? It's not. He said, say tour. I said, tour. He said, I yeah. say tour. I'm like, oh. Spell it like, out. Yeah. That's right. That's not nice. So Which, probably my favorite snack is whatever's in the cooler. How about a butt? What are you what are you doing with Twinkies? Yeah, no. Um I eat a little bit of everything. My wife makes these oat balls. It's got oats, honey, raisin, and peanut butter in it. So it's like a little oh, bit yeah, healthier. Good. They're good. Yeah, they're good. I always steal them out of the fridge whenever <laughs> he brings them. He does. She has to make extra when I know uh Matt's gonna be there. Yeah, uh I'm pretty sure there's a story behind this one. And I don't know if I want to get into that one. What's your favorite place to eat it or not? It won't get food. Oh, that place is delicious. Actually, I think it went out of business. It's called DG's. And uh, I took Duke there before one of the BFLs. Was Matt there too for that one? Maybe. I think Matt might have been there too. um, Chicken parm place? Yeah. And we got chicken parm, Matt, my wife and I. And then Duke got like chicken Alfredo. And he was up all night and he was in bad shape. (laughs) <laughs> Adam trying to throw his wife under the bus here says that's the only time whenever you guys come to town it's the only time she likes to work straight there Brandy's the best yeah, good sure. dinner when you go there so what about uh, Michael Ward that's one of the local language around here I, I actually live close to Lake Martin Becker what do you think about Lake Martin how's like it treat you pretty good huh yeah I liked it you know I don't know what it is but Whenever there's a fishery that has spotted bass and largemouth, like I just seem to do well, and I can't explain it, but it just seems to mesh well. And I just like the all the different available cover, and you know the different sections of the lake fish a little different. So I just like to you know spread out the field very well, and I could uh, just kind of pick a section of the lake that I like and, and focus in there. Um, Basically, I just sight fished that whole event, so I got pretty lucky and found one pocket that had some big largemouth in it, and that's what I rode to a top 10 finish, to be honest. So realistically, if it wasn't for that one little pocket that I stumbled in, you know, I, I would have just been middle of the pack. But, man, it's a great place. You go and catch as many fish as you want and always, always getting bit, whether it be a little spotted bass, a largemouth, a striper, or whatever. But you're always catching a fish in Lake Martin. That's a fact. There's a bunch of them there. It used to be, we've actually gotten hair in there now. And uh, they just kind of, I don't know if they got put in there on purpose or if the striper wranglers accidentally had some get wet, you know, they were bait or how it got started. Because I don't think it's been documented. I, I think that people just put them in there probably. But um, yeah. Changing the fish. I mean, one of the big things that it's done is just up the average size of, you know, Back when I was a kid, like I said, we fished there all the time. You could go out there and take off from Wind Creek. We're running down the lake, and there's a boat on every point already, like Carolina Rig. And right. you just donate her, donate her. Because they're going out there and fishing. Yeah. There would be five spots for 482 or something like that. Within the day. Like, why would you even go out there and subject yourself? Seven and a half pounds, good bag of spots doing that all day. You know, but yeah. now, there's in the fall, we had a, um, one tournament was unreal. Where all those herring came up and the the fish were hitting on top, I had like fourteen pounds of ice. Didn't catch those, but in the fall, that's usually a, a really good. I mean, it'll win a lot of them, 11, 12 pounds win sometimes. And if I'd have even landed those fish, fishing the way we used to fish, I would have finished like nineteenth or something. There was uh, two or three eighteen pound bags of spots, a seventeen pound bag, or two or three seventeen pound bags of spots, and like five sixteen pound bags, and they were all spots. It was real. You know, going into the event, that was my plan was to chase those big spotted bass with a swim bait. And uh, I had a couple bed fish after practice, and I uh, I started on spotted bass. I fished a couple spots and, and didn't really catch them. And then I I went and started bed fishing, and I caught the first couple that I had. And then I was like, man, eh, maybe I better run some new water. And I just started running new water and, and found some more large moth that were on the bed. And uh, – I kind of got addicted to it, to be honest. You know, it's kind of like playing cat and mouse and messing with them. So, like, 
right or wrong. Like I got addicted to it during the tournament and just kept kept going after him and uh stumbled onto him and ended up weighing in mostly large mouth that event and if if i would have i would have put money on it before the event that i would have weighed in like all spotted bass because that was my plan what's bizarre is that one weekend or two weekends probably back in like i said maybe september of last year the weights were unreal i mean there was three and a half pound spots everywhere and or, and or down there on the bottom end of the lake for the most part but like they yeah. put them in the bags and a lot of guys would have them and uh, it just disappeared. Like the next week, it went to like 13 pounds, went again. And I kind of waited for that herring spawn to happen, you know, where that, that's the deal on Murray and Clarks Hill and all these different places with these herring. And I never really saw that blow up this spring either. So uh, I don't know where they went. I don't know if they're just out there. Not, that's, I'm not good offshore. I despise having to go out there and chase a suspended fish that's 80 foot deep. And there's no way to even throw something at it. If you throw something where it's at, you got to predict where it's going to go. Or call them up in the top waters. And it'd be cool if you get if you dial it in, just like that weekend. I mean, if you dial it in, you'll blow out tournaments. But everybody out there knows they're there now, and we're all trying, and nobody can really get it dialed in. So it's a pretty interesting deal to see how that herring change a fishery, you know. And that's exactly what's going on Mark right now. It's changing that place. And at some point, I had a buddy that was out there when that was going on. And, uh, you know, at some point it affects the large amount too. The spots kind of get associated with them faster, but he was out there fishing that way and he caught like a three pound spot, a three pound spot, a five pound large mouth and three casts and Dang. 60 foot of water, you know, so it's going to be weird to see. I really don't like the idea of all the large mouth leaving the bank. I think some will stay on the bank. I mean, it happens in all those fisheries, but there'll definitely be some of the population that moves out there. But if you get a bite, it'll be a big one. So interesting to see. See what else we got here on the. The gobies have done similar things to Oneida too. How they used to chase the yeah. owlwives around. Now those smallies are all looking down. They're all facing the bottom. They're not. They don't school like they used to, and all that. It's similar to the whole herring deals getting into the, the lakes down south. What uh, I don't know, Caleb here wants to know what your go-to pre-spawn and spawn pattern is on the upper bay, Great. If everybody like, follows me at all, they'll figure out pretty quick I'm addicted to throwing a Z-Man jackhammer. I I throw that thing everywhere I go, and I catch them on it. This year, there's probably been multiple days on the bay where that has been the only thing I've thrown until my arm just gets tired. And then I'll pick up something and drag it a little bit slower. But the last – I haven't been down this week or the week uh, – I might have been down the week before. I don't remember. But um, I've been catching most of them on a jackhammer. They've been fishing out in the flats. The grass is growing nice now. Um, the water's clearing up with it getting filtered out by the milfoil. So finding those ditches out there is where those fish were staging, and now they're spawning actually on the flat themselves in that grass. Matt, uh, Matt wants to know here. Becker, we'll let you answer this one if you've done it. If not, we'll go at the butt. But what's your strategy in fishing an hourly big bass tournament? Do you ever fish one of those? I have not. I have not. I would love to. I think it sounds pretty cool. You know, I've always looked at the results and watched them. It seems like there's so much strategy that goes into them. You know, I think you're allowed to keep like three fish in the live well. And uh, you can weigh in once every hour or whatever it may be. So like, you know, you could hold a fish and try and win one hour or, or whatever. It just seems like there's so much strategy that goes into them. But, I mean, if I was there, I would I would try to win, you know, the whole thing. So I would just throw the biggest bait I got, a big swim bait or glide bait or something, and just pray for the best, you know. At that yeah. point, you're only fishing for one bite, so who cares? Yeah, and Randy, that's... what do you would pick up? Do I? Oh, oh. Oh, Kurt. Kurt would pick up the old uh, <laughs> bag draft. 10-inch <laughs> bag draft and throw that thing all day. The 10-inch. Oh, yeah. Oof. What a uh, – they used to have those, and I'm pretty sure there would be like a radio station you could tune to and listen to the weigh-ins where you could try to do that game plan and the hourly weigh-in will be going on and, you know, 13 minutes left and there's a four-pounder in third place. And you're like, I got a four and a quarter. I wonder if I need to go run it. And I would imagine they do all that now, like live streams on your phone and everything. You should, there would be so much strategy to try to 
I don't know if you're better off just not paying any attention to it. You catch five pounds and go straight in and weigh it in. You know, I don't know. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think it would be cool to do it sometime. And, you know, if I ever had enough free time or it, it aligned, I would love to, to get into one of them. But um, without ever doing one, you know, I, I don't have any tips or anything besides pick up the biggest bait you got and pray for the best. Yeah, it looks like Matt said it's mainly in South Texas. So South Texas, yeah, pick up a big bite, go. You got plenty of opportunity there to get a big bite. So, yeah. All right, what uh, let's see. Adam back back to Adam. He wants to know if it's a hit to hit one on one situation on Thousand Island. Who's gonna win it, Buck or Becker? Buck. <laughs> it depends. On, I don't know about that. Maybe if I can go out <laughs> to the lake, I probably. I don't know. You can catch him out of the lake too. I'll never put my sure. I'll never pick myself against anybody, so you're, you're going to lose that question. Yeah, I guarantee it wouldn't be me. I wouldn't even, so are there actually a thousand islands on thousand? Has anybody ever counted? That's how uh, much I'm There's doing. definitely more than a thousand. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Huh. And then there's so, something like there has to be like two th- two trees and like a little bit of grass growing for it to be an island or, or some obnoxious rule. So there's, there's plenty of plenty of islands that maybe not even are considered islands because they don't fit the criteria. But there's some some weird thing where there has to be like two trees or grass growing or something for it to be considered an island. Hmm. Well, uh, I think Derek and I are going to hang out a little while longer on here, but we appreciate you guys hanging out with us. Uh, enjoyed talking. Uh, Becker, hope you get out there and whack a bag tomorrow. Catch me a couple of eights, and uh, I think you'll be doing all right. Yeah, a couple of eights sounds good. You know, I was hoping for just one, but two is even yeah. better. So. You're going to have to poke big. Yeah, That's shoot. Right. shoot, I got to hope for just a limit to, be, to begin yeah. with. So hopefully we can find five more that are dumb enough to bite my cricket and uh, put them in the live well. All right, Becker, we appreciate you, brother. Get out there. Good luck. Thank and, you, guys. I appreciate it. Thanks for coming on, boys. Uh, we'll see. Uh, appreciate you, brother. We're going to uh, yep. hang out a minute here longer, but we'll wrap up our segment. And uh, appreciate you spending some time with us tonight. Good luck out there on the water. Yep, anytime. We'll see you guys. Have a great. All yeah. right. I'm calling a five-second timeout. It has gotten dark outside, so i got to turn the light on. All right. Derek's calling the timeout. He'll be right back. So, in the meantime, hello, darkness, my old friend. Yeah, it's nice to talk to you. Look at that deer in the background. I got a little shadow. It's kind of creepy. A little shadow up on the roof. Oh, that is kind of creepy. Look at that. Yeah. Wow. All right. So we'll do a little housekeeping here and talk about Angler. Yep. Just, you know, the company we're doing this with. And I'm going to pull up. I've had a little trouble. I'll share this through quick time. i got to figure out how to do a screen share deal from my iPhone to my Mac. But we're going to go over here to Explore. And talk about this 108 degrees challenge here, Derek. What's going on? So the 108 degrees challenge is by far the largest prize package we have uh, presented since we started challenges a couple months ago. Uh, There are over $5,000 worth of prizes. Uh, So there's rods, reels, baits, uh, torpedoes thrown in, red line lures, Dakota lithiums put in some batteries. Um, And then today we announced that Jackson Kayaks has thrown in a big rig HDFD which is a massive kayak. Uh, it's actually the one that was used to film on the 108 degrees series. Um, I currently have it at my house. So if no one wants it, uh, when you're drawn to win, like, it's okay. can I, no worries. Can, um, can I enter this? You can, anyone can enter. And it's, how is the winner cho- chosen? Is it random? All right. So, you have to catch eight fish after accepting the challenge, record those catches in the angler app in a trip. And then you'll get a badge uh, congratulating you on completing the challenge. You have to screenshot that and then share it to your Instagram story or your Facebook, or you can share it straight to your Instagram tag angler and use the hashtag 108 degrees challenge. And that will finalize your entry. Once that's done, you're in to win all sorts of stuff. Also, there's a second kayak. I can announce that now. Uh, I just got a text this evening. Bonafide is throwing in an SS 107. Nice. Kayak. And whoever wins that, also gets a fishing trip with Tyler Anderson of Tyler's Real Fishing. Nice. Well, Tyler, Tyler's a good dude. So that's not, that, it looks like it's going up every day as far as the amount of prizes they're going to be involved in this deal. So that's pretty cool. 
Yeah, we're, we decided not to announce them all at once, so we're kind of slowly, you know, throwing out prizes each week. Um, I probably can say this. There's probably going to be over close to $10,000 worth of prizes by the time we're done. That's awesome. And, and again, it's easy to just get a mailer out. Um, you know, there's probably what it will pull up uh, to start with, I guess. Or yep, and then go to Explore. And there you go, Explore. Yep. Your explore, and then it'll take you to the feed. You can click challenges at the top. It's pretty easy navigate navigationally. I don't know if that's yeah, word. Nav navigationally. Sure. Right. It sounds well. Navigate. Uh, anyway, so yeah, we appreciate you guys hopping on and watching the show with us here. We're gonna go ahead and slide that aside. And uh, Derek, you know, appreciate you hopping on too, bud. Enjoy. I appreciate it. you having me, Shay. I know you. Uh, you have one more question to ask everyone before you wrap up. Yeah, I'd like for y'all to ponder something for me. We need Where to name this segment, too. Yeah, I'm talking about doing these ponderers. Paul's while we ponder here at the end of every show. And I, I've got a question, and I just don't know the answer. I'm not sure there is one. Why do we drive on parkways and park on driveways? Good luck with that. Let us know in the comments. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm very curious. Driving on parkways and parking on driveways makes no sense to me. But this is Shane Baker, Derek Warner of Wishing I Was Fishing. We've enjoyed it. Hope you have. See you next time. See you next week. <laughs>